Hello, my name is Sam Ord. I'm a doctor from uh, Nepean Hospital working in the intensive care unit. And this is a, a lecture for the Focus Cardiac Ultrasound Lecture Series. And this is on ultrasound physics. During this lecture, I hope to take you through uh, a little bit about the properties of a sound wave. We'll talk about the ultrasound beam and some of its characteristics. The actions of the sound waves in the body and finally discuss uh, ultrasound artifacts, which are incorrect representations of anatomy in the ultrasound image. Sound waves are mechanical compressions that, are, that travel in parallel, and they travel sort of perpendicular to the actual direction of travel. And just the same as we have sound waves such as you're hearing me now, ultrasound sound waves are no different, just of a slightly different frequency. And if you were to draw the sound wave on uh, a graph with pressure over time, you get this sinusoidal pattern to a sound wave, which is meant to represent areas of compression or increased pressure, and then areas of rarefaction or decreased pressure. There are a few parameters that you should be aware of that we use to describe sound waves. The first is wavelength, which is the distance that is occupied by one cycle, or one cycle of a compression and a rarefaction. We can, term, we can determine this wavelength based on if we know the velocity and the frequency using the simple equation, velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Now, as we'll discuss in a moment, there are different velocities of sound waves in the body, but the ultrasound machine is obviously not able to determine what type of tissue a sound wave is going through, so it assumes that the velocity is constant as it sends out an ultrasound wave. And that velocity is 1,540 meters a second, and this is a way that we can determine the distance uh, of a structure using ultrasound, because the machine knows the frequency that is sending out a uh, it's the frequency that is sending out a, uh, a sound wave and how long it has taken uh, and it knows the velocity and from that way it can figure out what the depth is. The amplitude is the maximum variation from normal, uh, the, peak, uh, the peak pressure and how that variates varies from normal and that's measured in pascals or megapascals. The frequency is the number, of, uh, the number of cycles per second, which we measure in hertz. And as, as we talk and as we listen, we're hearing anywhere between sort of 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Ultrasound, of course, we can't hear, and that's because it is a much, much higher frequency, somewhere in the region of 2 to 15 uh, megahertz or million hertz. The ultrasound period is the amount of time that one cycle or one area of uh, a peak, uh, peaks of um, uh, the rarefaction and the peak pressure, the peak compression. And it's the time that's occupied by one cycle. We can determine the period, which is typically described in microseconds, as being one over the frequency in megahertz. And so typically we're getting, uh, we're getting a, a period of being approximately one or less microseconds uh, in time. And the ultrasound images that we look at are typically made up from not a continuous cycle of ultrasound. It's actually set up by different pulses that are sent out. And the ultrasound crystals will send out one brief pulse and then it sends that out into the body, and then it listens as the reflections come back. And the sooner the reflection comes back, the closer that structure is to the transducer. We describe these 2D images that we see. They're also known as B-mode images. And there's another type of image that we'll also describe, which is called M-mode, or motion mode. And typically, these ultrasound pulses that we're sending out to form these images 
uh, we send out around about two to 4,000 pulses per second. The pulse is typically between two to four uh, wavelengths. And so we get a, uh, you can figure out the total pulse length by timesing the wavelength by the number of pulses that are contained within that pulse. We spend much, much more time listening for ultrasound reflections than we do actually sending out the pulse. And it's somewhere, we describe that as the duty factor. And it's, the duty factor is typically between 0.1 to 1 of a percent of the time. So we're spending 99 to 99.9% .9 of the time listening for sound waves being reflected back rather than transmitting the ultrasound wave. An important parameter to consider is uh, what's known as axial resolution. So this is our ability to distinguish two points that are close together. And we do it in the, in the axial plane, or the plane with which the ultrasound is traveling in. So if I was to take these two points to try and demonstrate, my, uh, to demonstrate this issue. So the ability to distinguish two points that are separated from each other in that axial plane is dependent on the pulse length. If these two points are smaller than the pulse length, then the ultrasound machine is not going to be able to distinguish that these two points are separate from each other. And if you were to imagine the ultrasound wave flowing out of this transducer and flowing in the body, and then it hits that first point, some of it will be reflected back and some of it will continue on. And we'll discuss this a little bit later. If you imagine that that reflected portion, as the sound wave continues, it then hits the second point and some more reflection is going to come back, and the sound wave still continues on. If we now think about that reflected uh, sound wave that comes back, it will still be a one continuous sound wave, a one continuous pulse. And that's because these two points were smaller than the total pulse length. If we now consider these two points, which are greater in distance than one pulse length, that means that as the ultrasound hits that first point, it gets reflected back. There will then be a separation in the, in the reflected ultrasound pulse before we start getting a reflection from this second point. So using this schematic, these first two points would not be able to be distinguished from each other on the ultrasound image that we form, whereas these two points, they would be. And that's because they are separated by a greater distance than the actual pulse length itself. So if we wanted to improve our axial resolution, what would we have to do? Well, there are two things that we can do. We can either look at increasing the frequency, and if we try and remember back to a few slides ago, if you increase the frequency, you reduce the wavelength. So if we were to increase the frequency or simply reduce the number of cycles in that pulse, that will make that overall pulse length smaller. And if that pulse length is smaller, therefore we get a greater ability to differentiate between two points that are separated in that axial plane or the direction that the ultrasound wave is traveling in. So for improved axial resolution, we can increase the frequency or we can reduce the number of cycles in the pulse. The ultrasound beam, as it comes out from the ultrasound wave, is actually made up from a collection of ultrasound crystals that send out the beam. And we call a collection of ultrasound crystals that send out a beam an array. And that's why we get the terms of phased array or curvilinear array for the different types of probe. Drawing a schematic for what that sort of ultrasound wave would look like if we could see it, we get this kind of three-dimensional structure that we can see up here. Put in a 2D plane, we get an area where you can see that the ultrasound beam comes together, then separates. You have a near field, you have a far field, and most importantly, you have a focal zone. And in this focal zone, this is where our resolution is going to be the best. This is where the, the, the maximum power of that ultrasound beam is. And it's at this plane that we sort of focus our attention on. And when you are talking about optimizing an image, it is important, as well as to remember things like depth and gain, it's also to, important to remember to put your focal position in the area that you're most interested in. If you see an abnormal structure or you're trying to look at the left ventricle, you need to put your focal plane at the left ventricle level, and that will give you the best resolution you can to see the area that you are most interested in. <laughs> 
In terms of forming a two-dimensional image or a B-mode image, we start off by sending out a pulsed ultrasound. We send out a pulse ultrasound and we send it from a group of crystals called the array. And if we imagine this bar here to be the entire transducer uh, ultrasound crystal uh, dimension, we just use a small portion of the ultrasound crystals to send out the first beam. And we send this beam out into the, uh, out into the tissue and then listen for reflections coming back. And we see that in this schematic here. We send, this is a, so this would be a phased array uh, transducer or an echo probe. And we send, it out, we send out the first line at an angle on the right. And we send out one pulse, and we listen for it to come back. And once we've uh, listened for as long as we need to, we then send out the next pulse. And when, then we send it out, and we listen again. And then the next pulse, and the next pulse, and the next pulse. And we get this kind of uh, arc that gets formed. And the picture that we know, being this two-dimensional image that we can see here in the apical four-chamber view of a normal contracting heart, this sector is made up from many different single lines. And this is how we determine what our frame rate is. So if we send out one pulse, and then we listen to it, and then go to the next section, send out another pulse, and listen for it, and then together that makes up one frame once we've completed the entire sector, we can then repeat it again. And this is how we get our frame rate. Typically, we're looking at a, like the image that we're seeing here is probably at a frame rate of anywhere between maybe 40 to 80 frames a second. Now, our eyes can naturally pick up anything less than about 25 frames a second, and it looks uh, staggered to our eye. But if we're actually talking about trying to make accurate measurements and we're actually trying to assess for instance, you know, how, what the maximum diameter of that left ventricle is, for instance. We want to try and pick it up as accurately as can, which means that we want to pick it up as often as we possible, possibly can so that we can pick that maximum diameter, for instance. And that means that we need to have the maximum frame rate possible. So let's just think about that first frame, that, that first ultrasound line that we sent up down there. The, d the length, that the, the amount of time that we have to listen for that ultrasound pulse that comes back depends on the length that we are measuring to. And that's why it's important to determine the depth when we're talking about image optimization. Because the greater depth you have means that the longer time that the ultrasound machine has to listen to try and hear all the reflections that are coming back from that pulse that it sent out. I guess all I'm trying to say is that with the greater depth you have, the more time that we have to spend listening, which means that the less time we have in a second to make as many frames as possible. So the, the further the depth is, or the increased depth is, that is going to decrease your frame rate. The lower your frame rate, we also describe as meaning decreased temporal resolution. And that will impair our ability to measure something as accurately as possible, because we may simply just not be capturing, or capturing it accurately enough during that cycle time. I'll now talk about the M mode, or the motion mode uh, way to image. And with an M mode image, we send out our pulsed ultrasound wave, and we send it from one group of arrays, and that is it. We don't focus on other arrays. We just focus down this one array. You can see it here on this image here, and it's a parastonal long axis view that we're looking at here through the tips of the mitral valve leaflets so that we can assess things like left ventricle size. We can get an idea of what wall thickness is. And the advantage that this mode has is that it has much, much better temporal resolution because it's got a fantastically high frame rate, somewhere in the order of a thousand frames a second. And that's because the machine now doesn't have to worry about any other groups of crystals. It just has to worry about one array or one group of crystals, and it just sends down a pulse and then listens, sends down a pulse and listens, just down that one plane, which means that you can have a much, much greater frame rate. So we'll talk a little bit further about the detail resolution and just try and summarize some of it. So in terms of detail resolution, your ability to see something on the ultrasound image, that's made up both from temporal resolution, and as I said, the greater the frame rate, the better your ability it is to see uh, a moving structure. And even though you might not be able to tell the difference between 40 frames to 80 frames a second to your naked eye, when you actually slow it down and make measurements, you will.
well as temporal resolution, we have axial resolution, which is our ability to separate structures which are on the axial plane or the plane that's uh, the, in the direction of travel of the ultrasound beam. And finally, we'll talk about lateral resolution. And lateral resolution is our ability to separate two structures that are on that plane that is perpendicular to the direction of ultrasound travel. And this is where, again, the focal zone becomes very important. Because if we try to determine the difference between two structures up here in the near field or two structures in the far field, they will seem as one structure in this schematic. Whereas in the focal zone, we can see here that the two images are now separated by that, uh, that focal zone uh, thickness, lateral thickness, which means that these two structures would seem like two different, uh, two different points. It's important to remember that axial resolution is always better than lateral resolution. When we form an image, there are various things that we can do to these different groups of crystals or the different arrays. And that's what we're trying to explain in this uh, diagram here. We can either send down voltages to hit the different crystals and send out the ultrasound beams at the same time, or we can try and do a few different things to the arrays in terms of delays to uh, exciting those different individual ultrasound crystals or ultrasound arrays. For instance, we can focus the beam. If we send the voltages down to the outer arrays before the inner arrays, that will mean that we can end up focusing the beam electronically. This can also be done by, uh, by putting the ultrasound uh, crystals in a curved format, actually on the probe, but that would then limit our ability to actually image some of the structures. So it's much better to do it electronically with this phased array process. We can then also steer the beam by if we hit the array at the top first and the one at the bottom next. That means that we can steer the beam, around, steer the beam to one side or another. And then if again, if we have both the steering and the focusing combined, we can do both of them. Now these different electronic ways of steering and focusing are used by each of the different types of transducer that we use in the critical care setting. The different types of transducer we use at the top, you can see here is what's known as a linear array. And this transducer has a three or four centimeter by one centimeter foot plate, and it sends out the ultrasound beams in a straight pattern, in a linear pattern. And we have, a very we have a higher frequency to these linear probes, which means that we can image down here about the four to six centimetre uh, depth. That's as opposed to what's known as a curvy linear array. And this transducer's maybe got a seven centimetre by two centimetre foot plate, which means that you've got a, a much sort of greater area which that uh, foot plate is actually in contact with the skin. And it makes this kind of sector with a curved top looking up. And we're imaging down to a maybe 20 to 25 centimetres depth. And that's because the frequency is much less. And finally, the one that we are talking about a lot during this lecture series, which is the phased array. And this phased array transducer probe sends out this wedge, and it sends it out from a single point. And it has quite a narrow foot plate, maybe about one or two centimetres by one or two centimetres. And that means that it can sit in that intercostal space very nicely. And using a phased or a delay, which steers the probe and steers the ultrasound uh, waves in different directions, uh, we can also, uh, we can therefore try to image uh, as, as much of the heart as possible, just with keeping the probe in one position. In terms of what actually makes up these probes, probably the most important part of the structure is called the, uh, is the tr in the transducer, is the piezoelectric crystals. And these sit up at the top of the ultrasound probe, and these piezoelectric crystals can generate the actual ultrasound waves themselves. By providing an electrical force or a voltage to these piezoelectric crystals, we can cause the crystals to expand and contract, and that's what forms the sound energy in the ultrasound waves. And in return, those sound waves, and they then get reflected off a structure in the body and come back, and they hit the piezoelectric crystal. That piezoelectric crystal then is forced to contract and expand by that sound wave, and that, and that energy is transferred into electrical energy. 
So these piezoelectric crystals are at the foundation of our ability to uh, image uh, via ultrasound in their ability to change electrical energy into sound energy and sound energy back into electrical energy. As these sound waves then travel into the body, we're going to start losing power. So these sound waves are going to be absorbed to some extent. And when these sound waves get absorbed, they get transferred into heat. And we'll talk about this in a little bit in terms of the safety of uh, sound waves, because however infeasible it is possible because of this attenuation that sound waves can cause damage by one of the one of the ways that they can potentially cause damage is by transferring uh, transferring their energy into heat. Now, I'll note, and again, I'll discuss this a little bit later, that there are no epidemiological studies or any evidence at all that uh, the, the power at the ultrasound imaging intensity has ever caused any damage at all. There's no evidence behind that. But as I say, it, it is feasible, and that's why we have to be sure that we are using it as, as little as possible. This attenuation or this uh, loss of power of this ultrasound wave can happen because of absorption and transfer into heat, but also because some of the ultrasound waves get scattered and reflected off into different areas that's not picked up by the sound wave. The basic premise is that the further the, or the greater depth that you image, the more you are going to lose some of your ultrasound power. And so this is what limits some of the depth that we can image. And as that sound wave propagates through the body, it becomes weaker and weaker. This attenuation is proportional to frequency. And the higher the frequency of a transducer, the faster it will be absorbed. And hence why something like a linear probe can only image maybe four centimeters, whereas something like an abdominal or curvy linear probe can image to 25 centimeters. And that's because the linear probe is much higher frequency than the abdominal probe. And we typically measure this attenuation in decibels per centimeter. This table tries to put together a little bit about what I was saying in the last few slides. And here we can see at the top, the abdominal probe has a frequency in megahertz around about 2 to 4 megahertz. It has an attenuation coefficient of 1 to 2 decibels per centimeter, and its typical penetration is anywhere between 10 to 30 centimeters. We compare that to a phased array probe, or the cardiac echo probe. It has a frequency of 2.5 up to up to 7.5. It's got a slightly higher attenuation coefficient of 2 to 5 centimeters, uh, decibels per centimeter, excuse me. And its penetration is a little bit less than the abdominal probe because of that higher frequency which means that it can image down to anywhere between 15 to 20 centimeters. A linear probe typically has a frequency of around about 10 megahertz, attenuation coefficient of 5 decibels per centimeter, and that means its penetration is 4 to 6 centimeters. And finally, if we were to consider invasive probes, either uh, the ones used for transvaginal or for transesophageal probes, they have a frequency of around about 15 megahertz, uh, with a greater attenuation coefficient of 7.5 decibels per centimeter, and they can typically image to about 4 centimeters. And probably the transesophageal probes so maybe have lesser frequency than that, and they can image a bit further. So now we'll discuss a little bit about how these sound waves act in the body. And there are a couple of things that can happen to a sound wave as it goes through the body. The first of all is it, be, it can be transmitted between two structures, and it can continue going. And that's how we can image structures that are deeper to an area where we can see another structure. We discussed that an ultrasound wave can get absorbed by a structure, and that energy can be transferred into heat. And it can also be reflected. And of course, this is how we end up seeing structures that are present. And lastly, and it's not on this slide, you can actually have diffusion. And that's when a sound wave hits a structure and gets, uh, gets reflected in many different directions. And that's another way, as I mentioned, that we can get loss of uh, some of those reflections because they get reflected in different directions that are not picked up by that transducer. The transmission or reflection of an ultrasound wave uh, between two structures is dependent on what's known as the acoustic impedance of a structure. And this is all dependent on the uh, molecular density of a structure. And that's why something like air has a much, much lower acoustic impedance to something like bone. And that's because there are less molecules per uh, per sort of unit centimeter cubed. For a structure to be, uh, sorry, for an ultrasound wave to be reflected between two structures, you have to have a difference in the acoustic impedance. 
So for example, let's take the difference between something like water and fat. There's maybe, uh, you know, there's maybe just under a 10% difference in their acoustic impedance, and that means that just under 10% of those sound waves that will uh, hit the, uh, the border between those two structures will get reflected back, which means that 90% or so of the ultrasound waves will continue uh, traveling through to the next structure. If we have something like the difference between air and water, for instance, you know, we'll have a 99%, if not more, 99.9% .9 of the ultrasound waves will get reflected back and will not travel into the next structure. And that can be shown here in this schematic where we, what, we describe the incident uh, sound wave that gets sent out, the reflected sound wave that comes back that's you know, typically quite small compared to the amount of ultrasound that gets transmitted through. I'll ask you now to consider that second example that I gave about the difference between air and something like soft tissue. They have a massive difference in their acoustic impedance, which means that the vast majority of ultrasound waves will get reflected back. If you consider how you put that probe on the skin, there would be a layer of air that would be between that transducer and the skin. This is the whole reason why we use ultrasound jelly, to try and minimize that difference in the acoustic impedance between the two structures, which means that sound waves can then be transmitted through into the body, and that's the whole reason that we can image, uh, that we can image with ultrasound. And it's absolutely dependent on the ultrasound jelly, and that's because it reduces the uh, difference in the acoustic impedance and takes the air out of the equation. Times with the sound waves that get transmitted through. They, the, the, the ultrasound machine assumes that they travel in a straight line. Of course it has to. But what actually may happen is if you actually have a difference in the uh, propagation speed between two structures, and we do have differences in speed between, uh, between different uh, molecular densities, this can, cause this, uh, this can cause the sound wave to be refracted. And I guess it's a bit the same way as looking at a straw in a glass. We get refraction of, the, uh, uh, of, these, um, uh, of how we see that straw in there, and it looks like it's, a, it's bent, and of course it's not. And it's the same with the ultrasound wave, that it, it does get refracted and does get moved around because of the differences in propagation speed. It does require that the ultrasound wave hit at an oblique angle. And as it can be shown here, if you have a difference either uh, um, if the propagation speed in medium one is less than the propagation speed in medium two, we get, a ref uh, we get a refraction towards the right, whereas if it's less, we get a refraction towards the left. If we have the propagation speeds being the same between two, medies, between two mediums, then there's no refraction. If this sound wave is in its a normal instance or it's coming directly down at 90 degrees to the surface that's been reflected, uh, you will not get any refraction even if there is difference in the propagation speed between the two mediums. Let's talk a little bit about artifacts. And artifacts are the incorrect representations of anatomy or function uh, which are represented due to certain assumptions that the ultrasound machine makes. The ultrasound machine assumes that the sound, the ultrasound waves that it, uh, that it sends out, they travel in exactly straight lines. And that these sound waves travel at a uniform speed, which is 1,540 meters a second. Whereas we know that different structures have different molecular densities, which means that they will travel at different speeds. But the ultrasound machine cannot figure that out. It thinks that there is a constant attenuation through soft tissue, whereas again, there is different molecular densities and different structures, which means that there will be different attenuation through different soft tissues. It assumes that echoes from structures on that beam axis uh, only come from the beam axis, and that you don't get any uh, reflections that come from the side of the ultrasound beam. And that's because it assumes that that ultrasound beam that it sends out is infinitesimally thin and small, whereas it's not. I showed you a schematic there for the ultrasound beam that actually has a near field and a far field and a focal zone. And uh, the ultrasound machine does not uh, take that into account. It assumes that the amplitude of the echoes that are returned are relative to the reflective properties. It assumes that all echoes uh, are received before the next pulse is emitted. It cannot assume that there is any reflection 
uh, of two or more structures coming back to the ultrasound machine. It just assumes that there is one pulse of ultrasound that gets sent out, and when the reflections come back, it's just from one structure. And finally, it assumes that all of these echo reflections, they happen just the once. They can't come off two or more structures. I'll try and explain these a little bit further, and uh, we'll split up the artifacts into resolution artifacts, propagation artifacts, and attenuation artifacts. We've mentioned a few resolu resolution artifacts already, and those come in terms of axial resolution, and so that's the inability of the ultrasound machine to determine that two structures are separate from each other when they're on the axis that that ultrasound wave is traveling at, and that's because those two structures would be closer together. They're, they would be only separated by a distance that is smaller than the pulse length, as we discussed. The lateral resolution is the ability for the ultrasound machine to determine two structures that are separated from each other, but if they are smaller than the beam axis, then they will be displayed as one structure. This can be shown here on this schematic where these, uh, where these structures look like they are one complete structure, but these two are separated. The final one to consider, which we didn't mention earlier, which is the slice thickness artifact. And that's because the ultrasound beam has three dimensions. As well as the axial and lateral plane, it also has a slice thickness. And if you get any structure that enters into that area in that three dimension, it will also get reflected back. But the ultrasound machine was just going to consider that it is on an infinitesimally thin beam axis. There are many different types of propagation artifacts, and I'm just going to focus on four of them mainly. Um, but if you'd, like to leave, if you'd like to read more about these, there are many others. The first is the reverberation artifact. And I use this as an example here. of uh, uh, This is an apical four-chamber view. And here on the right side of the heart, we get to see this bright echogenic structure that is a pacing wire. Now, if you look up at the top in the ventricular portion of the, of the pacing wire, you can see it almost looks like there are three or four different uh, pacing wires that are in there. And that's being formed because the metal pacing wire has a very high reflective property because of its very sort of high acoustic impedance. And that means that these sound waves are going to get reflected off. And as they get reflected off, they will come and they will hit the side wall of the ventricle. They will then get reflected back and then get bounced back up to the ultrasound probe. And this means that the ultrasound machine gets a bit confused and it thinks the echoes are coming from multiple different areas along that line and that's what gives this, uh, these, that's what gives that sort of reverberation of the sound waves forms this kind of pattern of multiple uh, pacing wire uh, appearance on this ultrasound image. In a similar kind of vein you can sort of get a mirror artifact, so what should we describe, which is if you imagine an ultrasound wave that's, uh, that's traveling down this parasternal long axis view, and we've increased the depth here. And if you imagine an ultrasound beam that's coming down following my cursor, it would first hit the interventricular septum, and it would then come down, and it would hit this very bright echogenic structure, which is the pericardium. And some of it would be reflected back, heading towards the probe. But when it hits this structure here, some of it is going to travel back up to the, hit the ultrasound probe, giving us this very bright echogenic uh, line here. But this sound wave that's come down from the transducer, hit that pericardium, comes back up. Some of it is going to hit, for example, the interventricular septum again and be reflected back from the direction that it traveled in. And that means it's going to travel back down toward the pericardium, and it's then going to hit the pericardium and come back up again. And this is what conforms some of this structure that we see down below here, which is it almost looks like there's a mirror image of this mitral valve that's moving, this interventricular septum that's moving as well. And that's because the sound wave, as I said, has traveled down, hit the pericardium, come back up, hit the uh, ventricular septum again, been reflected back down to the pericardium, and then finally come back up to the ultrasound transducer. Now remember, the ultrasound transducer is sending out this pulse, and all it knows is that it sends out a pulse and then it listens. And depending on that amount of time until that reflector comes back, it can then use that to estimate what the distance is that that sound wave has traveled. But it doesn't know that that sound wave has bounced around inside the heart. It just knows that it's taken approximately 17 centimeters worth of time to get back to be reflected. And so it makes the assumption that there is another structure that's sitting back here. 
we mentioned about refraction artifacts, and this can form range ambiguity because the ultrasound machine assumes that this ultrasound wave is traveling in a straight line, and it will display this structure here. Whereas, a matter of fact, that sound wave has been reflected, and in fact, the structure that it's displaying is actually here. And that can lead to a small amount of range ambiguity, but also it can display structures in slightly the wrong position. Finally, we'll discuss attenuation artifacts, which include shadow uh, enhancement and edge shadowing. And these essentially are, are ways that uh, uh, an ultrasound beam has been attenuated or absorbed. For instance, we take this structure on the left here. If this imagine a very uh, calcified aortic valve, or if there's an artificial aortic valve there, then sound waves are not going to be able to trans transfer, uh, transmit through that structure as well, because most of them will be reflected back, and that's why it looks more echogenic. But what happens behind it is you get a shadowing. You can see it over here nicely with this sort of calcified cyst in this sort of soft tissue ultrasound, where the ultrasound beam would have come down, some of it being reflected back, giving us this, uh, elucidating this structure. But a lot of the sound wave gets absorbed in this structure, which means that you can't see behind it. So you get a shadowing, and that's because there are no ultrasound uh, power to go in behind it. On the flip side, if you have a structure where ultrasound beams get transferred very nicely through it, such as a cyst or the bladder, you can get a very you can get a, the you don't get a lot of attenuation that goes on through this structure because of the homogeneous nature of the fluid-filled structure, which means that it's still the ultrasound waves have a great deal of power at the back of it, which means that they show up very echogenic the structures that are behind a fluid-filled structure. Also at the sides here, you can see that we've actually got some shadowing that's going on. And that's because we have uh, increased tissue interface that's going along on the side. And that means that you can actually lead to have shadowing behind it because of the increased uh, uh, sort of surface area, if you like, of the differences in acoustic impedance. And that's it. Thank you very much. I uh, hope this was useful. Um, and that is uh, focused cardiac ultrasound physics. Thank you.